Hi, my name is Cecilia Puna. Welcome to this episode of Brave New Women. All around the world, there are amazing, ordinary women doing extraordinary things. Brave New Women is about giving those women a platform and a voice. And it's about changing the way that women are perceived. And it's a way of inspiring all of us to do the things that we've always wanted to do. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to be speaking to Gertrude Matchin. Gertrude grew up in Zimbabwe, but she now lives in New Zealand. It's actually not easy to introduce Gertrude because she does so many things. Her main activity is her company, which is called Her Story Circle. And Her Story Circle runs conferences, which is for women to speak and now for um, some men. She is herself a three times TED speaker. She's written several books and she's a ghostwriter. She coaches others on speaking, on how to write, and she's also a life coach. She's also very involved in giving back, which is mainly in helping girls in developing countries go to school. And on top of all that, Gertrude is also a textile artist and a fashion designer. So welcome, Gertrude. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me on your show. Gertrude, can you just, um, let's start with a bit of your, your background, where you grew up and how you ended up in New Zealand. So I was born in a small village called Wedza on the eastern highlands of Zimbabwe and Mozambique to two amazing parents. They had five kids. I was the second girl. So I have an older sister, three little brothers. Um, when my dad, the year I was born, 1967, my father got a scholarship to go and study in London. So he took his young wife. I was left at nine months with my grandmother and my sister. So my grandmother was like my second mom. She really was my mother. And they managed to raise money for us to join them in London when I was about three or four years old. So I lived in London until I was six. And then the whole family had to go back to Rhodesia. So before Zimbabwe had independence. And it was challenging because although my father had a degree from the UK, he couldn't get a white collar job because he was black. So my dad had to work in a chicken slaughtering factory, killing chickens. None of the corporate companies would take him. Mom had trained to become a nurse, so she got a job quite easily. And so they had five kids they were trying to put through private school on one salary practically. Mm -hmm. And they succeeded by teaching us how to make things so we could sell and raise money for our own school fees. So from the age of six, mom taught me how to sew, how to knit, how to crochet. And I was the younger of her two children at the time. I would go with her to all the white neighborhoods to sell our wares. Mm. My mother was the most amazing salesperson you'll ever meet. Just, yeah, I miss her. Mm. So when I was 19, I decided to go back to the UK to get my first degree. Got a place at South Bank University, Southwest London, doing a business studies degree. Unfortunately, I got pregnant three months after I got there. Didn't have a scholarship, so I had three jobs, couldn't go to school, I had morning sickness, and my boyfriend didn't want the baby at the time. So I was down and out in London trying to figure out how what to do, and I had met a Norwegian woman who had met me in Zimbabwe when I was 17. She had come to our village. And she watched me acting in a play. So you and I have got something in common in terms of the arts and theater. And this play was written in response to the AIDS pandemic. World Health had come to our village in a helicopter. And they were dropping flyers and free condoms to people who couldn't read. And I'm sitting on my grandmother's veranda, watching the parents running and catching these papers, crunching them up and lighting their fires. <laughs> I'm seeing the kids blowing up the condoms as balloons and running around the village. <laughs> <laughs> so I plucked up the courage at 17 to write to World Health. And I said, we've just observed your campaign. It's totally ineffective. Most people are illiterate. And they were running the workshops in English. And they would take 
the condom and put the condom on a broomstick and say, this is how you prevent AIDS. And every single hat had a broomstick with a condom behind the door. <laughs> so I was funded to they, create a women's theater group. Did, they, did the World Health, um, Health Organization ever respond? Yeah, they did. They sponsored me. And I wrote a play that had an AIDS theme to it because we passed down knowledge through our storytelling. And the message was in the play, in the music. And then we would run the workshops in the vernacular languages to explain what is a virus and how it's spreading. And that was the beginning of my work in the arts. I was part of the Zimbabwe Association of Community Theatres. And we were young political activists spreading political messages through plays. So this was at the age of 17? Age of 17, yeah. Goodness me. So I had this feisty spirit <laughs> and we were trying to bring down the dictatorship with these plays. Mm. Copying a copyright from Kenya who had taken down the Kenyan government. His name was Mugi Wathiongo. Because in Zimbabwe, you cannot have a public gathering without a permit from the government. But if you're having something at a school, a play, you can bring people into a school hall. Our messages were in the stories, in the songs, and that's how we were spreading these political messages against the regime. Anyway, to go back to the UK, this woman had come to Zimbabwe with a church group, watched me acting in the play, came backstage afterwards, and she said, where did you learn to act? I'm like, oh, this is just something I'm doing to help my community. And she said, you have a gift. And I will sponsor you if you want to go to college, if you want to do an acting degree. Unfortunately, I couldn't take that offer because my dad had just lost his job and the bank was about to repossess our home. So my parents were market gardeners. They had a little 10 acres of land and they, we needed somebody with a payslip to secure the mortgage. And I actually had four job offers at that time. My dad helped me build self-confidence by forcing us to go to the city and apply for jobs, but not take them. Mm -hmm. So every school holiday, when our friends were having fun, my sister and I were put on a bus, sent to the city to stay with a cousin, and we had to apply for jobs and not take them, just go for interviews. Mm -hmm. And I could have been an air traffic controller, <laughs> <laughs> an air hostess, or a COBOL programmer. And because my dad was an accountant, he sat me down and he said, there's this thing called a computer. He didn't even know what it was. He said, "It's technology is the thing. It looks like an adding machine, but it's got memory. And so he channeled me to be a first generation coder. I programmed computers in basic Pascal and COBOL. And I worked for the London Rhodesia company as a COBOL programmer. So this was, you, you were in Rhodesia at this stage or in London? I'm in Back in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. before I went to the UK, I had to quit school at the age of 17 to support the family. Mm -hmm. and then I took off when I was 19 to go to the UK. Mm -hmm. So I told this Norwegian woman I couldn't take her offer because I was trying to help my parents. And as she walked away, she came back and she handed me this business card. And she said, look, if you ever change your mind or if you're ever in Europe, I'm an email away. Two years later, I am down and out in London. I'm rummaging through my purse looking for coins so I could go and buy a loaf of bread. <laughs> and there's this business card underneath my last 50p. And I tossed up between buying a loaf of bread or calling a random stranger in Norway. Mm -hmm. I did that. And she was actually involved with her brother in recruiting actors to come to Norway to take part in a musical production about Nelson Mandela. So they couriered an etiquette to me the next day, and off I went to Norway, and I took part in this amazing production and toured the whole of Europe. We went to Sweden and Switzerland, and I'm dancing and acting in a play about one of my heroes, <laughs> and I'm pregnant, going every day. <laughs> My boyfriend tracked me down when I was about six months pregnant, begged me to come back to Zimbabwe and get married. So I abandoned my studies and went back home and got married. We eventually had three children together. 
They are now 32, 30, and 24. Unfortunately, our marriage disintegrated 2015. Hmm. So we moved to Cape Town at that time. I did go back to university when I was 27, finished off my business studies degree, made it in, majored in industrial psychology and management. My ex-husband now became an obstetrician. And then we went back to Zimbabwe to find our economy in ruins. The Zimbabwe inflation hits 316 quintillionth percent. All computer systems were crashing. There was no jobs. And so we decided to, to leave yeah. and ended up in New Zealand 21 years ago. Mm. Mm. Bang. Gosh, I mean, even that is a, is a good story in itself. Um, and so tell me, when, when did you start? Um, first of all, what did you do when you, when you were in New Zealand? We, you had your three children. Were you mainly looking after oh. them or was there? My IT career evolved into systems analysis and design and web design. And I got a job, so I managed to get in with the essential skills mm-hmm. that New Zealand was looking for. Got a job within two weeks and worked as a systems analyst to start off with. I went alone with the three children. We didn't have money for my ex to come at that time. So when I got the job, I raised the money for him to come. Unfortunately, the Medical Council of New Zealand would not register him as an obstetrician. Uh, the obstetrician system was so complicated, it took a whole year. So he came to Australia, got a job in Queensland in Mount Isa, and commuted and came home once a month for a year. So I was alone in New Zealand with three children under 12. Gosh. Full-time job and just losing it. Yeah. The youngest was three, the oldest was 12. And then I approached my boss one day wanting to renegotiate my work hours so I could work from home in the afternoon when the kids came home from school. Fortunately, my boss was in a very bad mood. He said, you don't have a choice. It's either you stay where you go. And I realized he was forcing me to choose between my kids and work and my babies are not negotiable. So I quit. Didn't even have a plan B. Told my poor husband who had come for the weekend that I had to quit my job. And I went back to my aunt. I fell back on my intuitive gifts, started painting my fabrics, went all over Wellington trying to sell this fabric. It would not sell. As you know, in New Zealand, unless you're selling something to the sheep, New Zealand is a very small country. (laughs) I ended up opening a small shop and exporting a lot of my work to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I had a website. Most of my sales were coming off online. And I closed that shop after a year and took my business home. I hit on my first million dollar idea while I was in that shop, though, Mm -hmm. because when my husband was job hunting, I noticed that there was a shortage for doctors. And I thought, I've got a human resources degree. What if I start a recruitment agency? (laughs) So it started off with me reaching out to some of our friends in Cape Town. And I said, we're in New Zealand. Do you want to come? Five of my husband's colleagues said yes. I made $125,000 in my first three months of business, Mm. sitting in my bedroom slippers at home. Mm. I had a recruiting agency called Medical Recruiters of New Zealand, ran that company for 13 years, went into property investing, got involved in recruiting people for the making of King Kong and Avatar. So I went into film and film production as well, actually quit my day job and went back to college and did a course in TV and film production at um, Avalon Studios for TV and Z. And that kind of took me on this road as a filmmaker, storyteller, digital storyteller. So life has been really fascinating. Um, Sure has. Latest business venture came out of depression. So like I said, our marriage collapsed after 27 years in 2015. And I packed a suitcase, left New Zealand, and traveled for almost 18 months, almost two years, just lost. I came to Europe, Germany, Rome, Madrid, bought this one-way ticket to nowhere. It took me to 14 countries, and I ended up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I had a client that I was coaching to write a book, 
and they needed a guest speaker for the Chamber of Commerce at the end of 2016. And I just stopped because I was on my way to California thinking I'd go and make my feature film in California. And it turned into the most magical experience because I ended up getting a job at the University of New Mexico lecturing in film, got my work visa, and then I got really ill while I was there, developed this strange dry cough that only came at night. And my kids said, mom, you're getting worse. I couldn't sleep lying flat. I'd start coughing. And when I went to this emergency center, they would give me cough mixture, headache medication, and send me home. My kids insisted I come back to New Zealand, thank God. So I did. Came back and found out I had high blood pressure. My blood pressure was in the 200s. Never on my radar because I always had abnormally low blood pressure, even when I was pregnant with my kids. So I never bothered to get them to check that. And so I saw my boys, they live in Auckland on the way back to New Mexico, stopped in Melbourne. My daughter is in Melbourne. And she said to me, mom, you've got to slow down. You're going too fast. I've bought you a 10-day vacation to Bali. And Bali is my healing space. I run all of my righteous retreats in Indonesia. And that 10-day vacation turned into a nightmare because I collapsed on the ninth day with congestive heart failure, sightseeing in a rice field in Bali. Mm. What was causing the high blood pressure? Stress. Because through my divorce, I lost everything. I had worked for 4.5 million property investing business, just everything that could go wrong went wrong with my divorce. And I was so highly stressed and I just kept going. I didn't stop. Mm. And so I came back home, tried to recover. And then one of my girlfriends puts my profile on a dating website. (laughs) (laughs) I had chronic fatigue. I couldn't get out of bed. I was putting on so much weight. And I said, Shannon, why would you do that? She said, you are going to get out of the house. You're going to put on some makeup, put on a pretty dress and start to walk. Go and have tea and coffee with these guys. Don't take it seriously, she said. (laughs) And the first man and the only date I went on is now my husband. (laughs) My second husband that way. And he bought me an electric bike so I could lose weight. Mm -hmm. He's a biker professionally. Hmm. And I was knocked off that bike by a male biker coming in the opposite direction, rush hour traffic in 2019. And I fell onto the motorway, was almost crushed by a big truck. And I came out of that accident with scratches. It was the strangest accident. Scratches on my finger, my elbow, and my knee, but the whole Hmm. left-hand side of my body was bruised. Hmm fell on my left-hand side. And so I, it felt like an energetic hit, like something had stopped me. There was something I was supposed to get. And I tuned into that. And I would go into my meditation and prayers every morning. And I would ask the question, what is my next step? What is my next step? And this business idea downloaded like an A4 piece of paper. It was like a diagram, like I was dreaming with my eyes open. And it was silos of women sitting in a circle of 10. But each of these women was connected to another 10. And another 10, so there were dots and lines and dots and lines. And I knew exactly what it meant. I went on Facebook and I put a post that went viral. And I said, I want to create these women's circles. I want to bring women together to share their stories, to inspire, to motivate, to encourage, to be the light at the end of somebody else's tunnel. In 48 hours, 2,500 women responded in 30 countries. So I launched my first event in Las Vegas in the US. Second one was in Wellington, third in Sydney in 2019. Beginning of 2020, I went to Norway, London, New York. Then COVID happened in March while I was in New York. 15 events had to be canceled for the first quarter of 2020 in North America and Canada. Had to come back home. I came through Brisbane. I had a conference in Brisbane, Auckland, Hamilton. Then everything stopped. And then we had a lot of family tragedies last year. 
My husband is from Poland. We lost my mother-in-law on the 29th of March, died of a sudden heart attack. Three weeks later, my mother died in Zimbabwe. Mm. My daughter had a miscarriage. Mm. I still don't know how I got through that year. Mm. And I got cyber hacked by women I was working with. (laughs) Mm. The scaling of the company, they got me thrown off Facebook, lost all of my Facebook groups. I had about 50,000 women following me on Facebook. Mm. And then a magical thing happened. So I have a policy that there are things that I have control over There's things I don't. So when I wake up and do my to-do list every morning, I fold a piece of paper in half. And on the right-hand side, it's everything I can achieve that day. On the left-hand side, it's things I have no control over that I give to the universe to sort out for me. Mm. And I remember it was now in um, November, and I was thinking of putting my speaking platform online. And I got this strange email on LinkedIn from a small boy, 23-year-old from Canada, living in Ireland. And he had done a social entrepreneurship degree. And his professor found my TED Talk online and played it as inspiration for the end of the, the term. His name is Eddie. And he said to me, Gertrude, I've just finished this course. Love what you're doing as a social entrepreneur. How can I support you? How can I help you? I'm living in Ireland. I had a Zoom call with him very much like this. Guess who he's working for in Ireland? (laughs) Facebook head office. Wow. Wow. Within two hours, this kid restored my Facebook account. He traced exactly what had gone wrong. Found out it was women I was working with who got me kicked off Facebook. They renamed my groups, hijacked them, created events similar to mine. I was offline for six months grieving when my mother died. And these are my so-called friends who did this. Mm. So anyway, I had to pivot. I put my platform online. We are scaling faster now than I could have done with physical events. And I think it's because women are seeking connection right now. Everybody's isolated and locked down at home. So we have this amazing platform where you come, you can be coached, you can be mentored to speak. If you don't have the self-confidence, I have all kinds of programs that I've created to teach women how to speak. And if you are really inspired to come on stage, it's very much like a TED platform. I'm trying to create a competing platform for TED, Mm -hmm. focused primarily on women. And when I launched, my aim was for women over 50, women Mm -hmm. like me, separated, divorced, widowed, at a crossroads, trying to reinvent themselves. And then a funny thing happened. The transformation with these women is what brought the men onto the platform. I started getting messages from the husbands, the sons, the nephews, people saying, what have you done to my aunt? What have you done to my wife? Mm -hmm. Because I believe when a woman can speak, it transcends everything, having the power to articulate your thoughts and your ideas. It affects your children. It affects your workplace, your relationships with a man. And so now 25% of our speakers are male. I also believe until women start bringing men into the rooms where we discuss women's issues, nothing much is going to change with the condition of women worldwide. Mm, I absolutely believe that. So we are scaling and we are a social impact movement with a vision that every woman who comes to the platform is not only coming to speak, she is coming to teach. So we have a series of of seminars online one month. In the next month, they run workshops. So we want a transfer of knowledge and ideas. The TED tagline is ideas worth spreading. Our tagline is inspired ideas ignited. Hmm. How can you come up with an idea that could ignite the fire in another woman so she starts something or she gets out of a bad relationships? Our broad categories are business and entrepreneurship, health and wellness, family and relationships, creativity, 
social justice, and spirituality. And so we encourage our women to speak from a position of strength, no matter what has happened to you, and not to allow your past to define who you are right now, and to let your story be the light at the end of somebody's tunnel. For them to see that, okay, I was raped, but I can live a good and healthy life. Or I was divorced and I was left with nothing and living in my car. And that's my story. Heart failure. But here I am. I bounce back and it's not even two years later. Hmm. So every story is there to inspire. So we are doing that. And then we curate all of these stories through my publishing company into a series of books. Each woman is published in a volume with 10 other women. So there's 10 women in each volume. They contribute three to 5,000 word chapters of their lives. We brand every single book. So it's every woman is on the front cover of her book. First chapter is hers and we interchange the same 10 stories per volume. We do this because I come to Europe every year to the Frankfurt Book Fair and I've come to learn from my personal story that a story is not just a story. Our stories are our intellectual IP. These are our ideas, things we've gone through. And so I help women reposition their stories and package them in different ways. So if a woman has written a business book, I can show them how to turn it into a board game, a webinar series, a video course. If a woman has written a memoir, can be sold for its movie rights. Mm. If you write a book in English, you can sell it for its foreign rights and it's printed in French and German and Italian. I've helped women who've written children's books go into merchandising like toys, cartoon characters, uh, games, because children learn through games. So our publishing company is not just about publishing books. It's about harnessing women's intellectual ideas and helping them repackage them and sell them. Mm. So that's what wow. we're doing. And, um, the money we raise for social impact comes from the publishing company. And it's a pay-to-play mm-hmm. platform. So people actually pay to come and participate and get the coaching and the mentoring as well. Mm-hmm. And tell me about the um, the social venture part. The um, um, where, 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 what, what things are you supporting? So when I started to travel, when I moved to New Zealand, throughout Southeast Asia, the Caribbean, I've been hired to set up women's cooperatives throughout Africa. And I do this with very small amounts of money. I'll give you a few examples. I was sitting under a mango tree with a group of women. After the AIDS pandemic, a lot of people who were affected were family members. My aunts, cousins, Husbands have died, they have children, no income. And I thought, what if through my clothing business, I gave them my designs to string up my African beadwork? So I went to South Africa, I bought some beads, sat under a mango tree, trained 20 women how to string up my beads. Then I started collecting secondhand cell phones from women in New Zealand and Australia. Most women in Africa don't have access to the internet, but they do have access to WhatsApp. So they will string up a necklace, put it on. Somebody will take a picture of them wearing the necklace and the story behind who they are, whether they're widowed, separated, divorced, how many children, how many family members they support. And they send me the picture through WhatsApp. I put that on our website and we sell jewelry. One of my necklaces can feed a family of five in Zimbabwe for a month. So it's all a matter of giving women access to the market and getting paid what their work is worth. I mean, our jewelry, they're pieces of art, really. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. And a lot of people come to Africa, they go into our marketplaces, and the next thing you see this product being sold on the runways in Paris, and the woman who made it, the village she's in, she got peanuts for it. So I want to try and cut out the middleman and people get to meet the woman who's made the necklace you're wearing and just making women more conscious about how we spend our money. We have another small little project where most girls in Africa don't go to school if they have a period. In Zimbabwe, for example, the government is not importing menstrual product that the the, the poorest can afford. 
most villagers, girls are using bark. They're using grass. If they have a period, oh, well, they just don't go to school. Gosh. So I shared the story when I launched in Las Vegas that I wanted to make reusable sanitary pads for girls. A woman in the audience was already doing this with a church group for schools in Honduras. And in the last year, she converted her garage into a workshop. They made a thousand kids for my girls in Africa. And they come in a beautiful little bag with seven pads for every day of the, of the week. They come with a menstrual chart so the girls learn how to track their menstrual cycle, know when it's coming. They come with two bars of soap and three pairs of panties. Most little girls are getting raped because they don't have underwear. Mm. So that's about the project. Mm, a lot of emotion there. We have a project. How bad is, tell me, just sorry, let's just, how bad is um, rape of, of, of girls in? In Southern Africa, a girl is raped every three minutes. A woman is raped. Every three minutes. And what age should That was the reason about? why I left Africa. In 1999, our medicine men started spreading a rumor that if you rape a virgin, it cures AIDS. Oh, for goodness sake. The incidence of child abuse in Southern Africa went up. My ex-husband was an obstetrician, and he came home in tears one night because he had to do a hysterectomy on a nine-month-old baby girl who had been gang-raped by three men. Oh, you're joking. Cecilia, that was the straw that broke my back. I have two little boys and a girl at the time. My daughter was eight. And I couldn't trust anyone around my children anymore. It was called The Virgin Cure. You can Google this. It's all over the internet. And that's why I left Africa. I wanted to find a safe country to bring up my kids. And I managed to do that. You leave everybody you love behind. My daughter has just had a baby. I'm in Melbourne right now. She's now a mom. She just turned 13. And I feel like I'm inside a dream. This was the vision. This was the dream I had 21 years ago. Mm. Mm. And I'm sorry I get emotional. It's because we are the lucky ones, you know. We got out of these situations. There are some people who just by luck of the draw of where you are born, you don't get to choose. You don't get to leave. Mm. There's um, some of the women that I'm talking to have set up schools in in Africa, and what they say is one of the big advantages of schooling is that it means that the children, the girls, aren't getting pregnant so early. Uh, Education is a key that unlocks everything. Mm. Mm. You know. Even the story of these medicine men, if you are in an educated population, those myths can be dispelled very, very easily. Yeah, absolutely. Education is the key. I, I remember when I created this theater group when I was 17, I would sit with some of my aunts and they'll say to me, Geshe, but what is a virus? Mm. We, we can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't touch it. What is this thing that's killing people? And I had to find ways to explain what a virus is to women who are illiterate by buying apples at the beginning of the week and I'll let them decompose. And when I ran my workshops, I would bring out a box of healthy apples, a box of rotting apples and say, this is like the human body. Something has gone inside this apple. It's eating away at it from the inside. It will shrivel up and it will die. And fortunately, in the 80s, you could see the face of AIDS. You could see the people who were infected, the lesions on their faces, the thinning hair, the weight loss. It was very, very visible. 
And that's why this has been a passion of mine my whole life. Because I'm just one of those lucky women who had these two amazing parents who instilled the value of education in me. Hmm. Gertrude, I female think that's a... Go, go ahead, sir. I was going to say female genital mutilation is something I advocate against as well. Mm -hmm. FMG happens in countries like Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, most of the northern part of Africa. And our mothers will pin down their daughters and cut everything away with a blunt razor blade. Most of these little girls are dying of secondary infections. They stitch them up with thorns. Oh, for goodness sake. They leave you a hole big enough for you to pee. Mm. On your wedding night, your husband opens you up with a knife to show that you're a virgin. Now, it's a practice that has been going on for 500 years. There is no way you can go into these communities and say, stop cutting the girls. The cutting is happening here in Australia. It's happening in New Zealand, in the UK, in the US. A very, very difficult practice to stop. Where we are succeeding, we are a group of African women who have left Africa. We go into communities and we negotiate. We sit with the parents, the grandmothers, the fathers, the aunts. The story is 500 years old. It started in nomadic tribes where the husbands travel with the goats and the cows for six months of the year. And to stop their wives from being promiscuous, they said, if you are not cut, you are not clean. If you are not clean, you will not get married. Now, you have to understand marriage is a form of survival for most African women. Mm. If you're not married, you'll starve to death. In these communities, it's semi-desert. So our mothers will do this, and they say this is a gift to my daughter mm. so she can get married. Mm. So where we have succeeded, we go into communities and we negotiate that when the rite of ceremony passage is going to happen, can we substitute by gifting the family with a goat? So in Africa, when you get married, there's a bride price, there's a dowry that's exchanged. My dad got goats, he got cows, there's a whole lot of money that comes with the marriage of the daughter. Why goats? Because goats multiply really fast. Where we're doing this is mostly in Kenya. A goat costs millions of shillings in Kenya. They produce milk. They don't kill them for meat. If they want protein, they puncture a vein, they drain the blood, they make blood sausages, they keep the beast alive. So we substitute the cutting by gifting the family with a 25 US dollar goat. And we guarantee that we'll help with money for school fees to keep the girls in school. So we're winning in certain areas, and that is another project that I am very, very passionate about. I've spoken in the United Nations twice, advocating against FMG. In New Zealand and Australia, I work in schools. I conscientize teachers on how to look out for the signs of trauma in little African girls. They will disappear for a week, two weeks. They come back changed, traumatized. We've got to try and prevent it before it actually happens. So that's some of the work that I've been doing since I left Africa in these communities and the places that I live. Well, Gertrude, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, it's just spending this hour with you has been a gift to me. Um, thank you for being so open. Thank you for your emotion. Thank you for all that you're doing. I think it's uh, absolutely extraordinary and so concrete and so impactful. Um, it's just a lot a, of work that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, I, I can't do this alone. The reason why I agreed to your podcast interview is you're helping to share my story. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Please connect me with as many women as you know who can come on board. We need support. We need help. What I'm really trying to create is a bridge 
between women in developed countries and women in developing countries so we can help pull our sisters up. Mm. Like I told you, it doesn't take a lot of money to get 100 women out of poverty. $5,000, $10,000 can do so much if the money hits the ground the way it's given. Mm. So I am trying to disrupt the narrative and change the paradigm of how people give and connect women with the communities that they are supporting directly. Unfortunately, with most aid organizations, if you give $20, by the time it hits Africa, it's 20 cents. Gosh. There's a lot of money wasted in administration and advertising. So we have to change the model of giving. Mm -hmm. I know that my job is just to facilitate the connecting of people. Mm -hmm. And that's what this platform is actually doing. Mm -hmm. so how do people, how do people, uh, what can people do concretely? Do they go onto your website? Is there a go on my website, uh, thehostorycircle.com. You can contribute by donating. You can contribute by seeing some of the projects I'm, I've started uploading. And if you have a particular passion, if it's education, just tell me what your passion is, and I will connect you with a passion project that's in line with what you enjoy doing as well. Fantastic. Okay, so it's herstory.com. Herstories. HerStoryCircle.com. Okay. Dot com, yeah. Fantastic. Um, Gertrude, the last question I ask is, um, it's almost redundant, but I'll ask it anyway, is for you in your in your life, has being a woman been positive, negative, both? Has it had an impact? What's it been like for you being a woman? I think before I incarnated in the skin as a woman, I chose this. It has been one of the most exhilarating rides of my life. Um, I wouldn't exchange who I am for anything else. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Women are natural creators. Women are nurturers. It's the women that I have met who have made me the woman that I am. It's my grandmother. It's my mother. The woman who nurtured me. I have had a phenomenal ride. And I know when I check out of this brown skin, <laughs> I can celebrate that I incarnated and I came to make a difference. And I helped a, a lot of women make a difference as well. And what a difference you're making. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's just been a, a joy to speak to you. And I'm sure people will love to will love to hear from hear your story. So thank you. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Brave New Women. Certain podcast sites such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, or Podchaser let you leave a rating and a review. The more ratings and reviews we get, the more people will listen and the more these women's stories will be shared. So I'd really appreciate it if you could. Thanks for listening.